What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen. On today's show, I've got Nathan DeWitt, and we talk about luxury homes and why you should be buying, renovating, and selling luxury homes. On average, he makes over $140,000 a house, and he only has to do a couple of them a year to make a million dollars. It's insane. You guys got to watch this. And if you're interested in seeing him on stage at Flip Hacking Live, make sure that you vote. Go to fliphackinglive.com, grab your ticket, and vote for Nathan if you want to learn more about how he's finding, funding, and renovating luxury homes to make a ton of money. But stay tuned, and Nathan is going to knock it out of the park. It was such an awesome conversation. I ran out of time. I wish I had 50, I had 50 more questions for him. You guys are going to love this show, and you will learn how to make a lot of money. My name is Bill Allen, and I'm the leader of a group of elite house flippers and wholesalers called Seven Figure Flipping. We don't brag or show off our success, but instead let integrity and stewardship be our guide. We are dedicated to helping people unlock the freedom they desperately need. If you ask other real estate investors, they will say to keep your secrets quiet. But we believe in abundance, not scarcity. And that's why we are the elite. We are Seven Figure Flipping, and this podcast is our playbook. All right, everybody, I am back with another awesome show today. I'm really excited to talk to my guest today. He came to our Myrtle Beach event, our Seven Figure Altitude Myrtle Beach event, just joined the Mastermind Group, actually, our Altitude Group. So we don't even really know each other that well. So I'm going to get to know him on the show along with you. But he, at the event at our Myrtle Beach Mastermind that we just had, I actually asked people who wants to be on the show that's never been on the show. And um, I had everybody raise their hand. There were about 30 to 40 people at least that raised their hand. And then I said, all right, this is what you got to do. You got to send me an email with some of the, the things that you can teach my audience. Like what are the things that you're doing really, really well to teach my audience? I got three emails. So, okay, 40 hands, three emails, right? And this one was the most detailed and honestly the most like eye-opening one. L listen to this right here. My spreads are always over $100,000 in profit. My best deal was 234,000 in profit and I average around 140K. Low volume, higher margins, less staff and overhead needed. So that bullet point right there is just one of eight bullet points that we're going to talk about today. So um, I think you guys know why I immediately jumped on and said, Nathan, when can I get you on? Can I get you on in a couple of days? And he said, yes, he's traveling um, in Detroit right now. And uh, here we are. So my uh, guest today is Nathan DeWint. And I'm excited to get to know you, Nathan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Myrtle Beach was awesome. And I'm, I'm glad to be part of the group. Um, I've been to a couple before that were not the best. And this is awesome. Everybody in the group is so is so cool. And I'm excited to be part of it. So yeah, I appreciate that. And you're doing some things that honestly, we've, we've had some people in the group doing it looks like higher end type homes, um, more luxury type stuff, which um, I've talked about with a few other guests in the past. And, and I know some people have done really, really well in it. But it's predominantly people in our group are, you know, um, median home price. And usually I teach that it's mm -hmm. entry level median home price, especially for newer flippers. Um, so they don't feel like they're one and done, you know, they lose a bunch of money. I've been burned on some of the higher end stuff. So I love these shows because you can teach me something too. So um, admittedly, I'm not the best high end flipper. Um, I've been flipping yeah. for probably 10 plus years now. And really in that first and second time home buyer, median home price, I like to stay where there's a lot of traffic. And um, I did one where it was on HGTV. And, you know, it's a seven, $800,000 house in Pensacola, which is very expensive for that area. And I lost 70 grand on that one. I did another one that was high end. It was like 650, 700 in the same area. I lost 50 grand on that one. And then I did another one that I sold and I made money on. It was right on the water, beautiful house, huge house. We did it really nice, made money, made like 40, 50 grand. But then I got sued two years later. And uh, when I was at the mediation, I actually bought the house back from the person. I said, look, you're coming after me for a bunch of money. This I didn't do what you say I, I'm doing. The lawyer had them like, arm, like strong armed him into suing me. And uh, we're at mediation. I said, look, I'll just buy it back. They're like, well, we put in a boat ramp and we put in a dock and we put in um, all this custom shelving. I was like, just add it all up. I'll just buy it back for whatever you have into it. And I bought it back. And then I, I Airbnb it for a year, resold it. And then a week before I, it was going to close, the hurricane hit it and did $300,000 in damage. <laughs> And so I sold it to the same buyer for a $300,000 loss. And I'm still in a fight three years later with all the insurance company. So I pretty much am 0 for 3 on <laughs> nice houses. And so yeah, I'm start. interested to hear your story and talk through some of that. I've done some podcasts. If you guys want to go back and listen to the one where I got sued, I've done that. We'll put it in the show notes. I'll have my team do that. And then I, the railroad track house that I lost 70 grand on is in my book. You guys can go to seven, uh, 
7ffbook.com. It's a free book, free plus shipping book. You can go check it out. It's in there. Um, I had a bunch of lenders on it, paid them back in full. They had no idea I lost 70 grand on it. So cool story. Um, all right, Nathan, tell me about you, man. I've talked for a long time in the beginning of the show. Oh, no worries. So I'll, I'll say that um, that's unfortunate. Mine's been the opposite. So the only houses I've ever lost money on are those median homes, right? Um, and I know kind of at Myrtle Beach and, and a lot of the members read Profit First. And the reason I'm bringing that up is he's got a line in there where he says, quit fighting human nature, right? So why I like my space is I don't have to fight myself with what I do. So I, when I first got into flipping, started over renovating everything. My dad's a general contractor. I've been raised in multi-million dollar projects since I was 12 years old. My parents didn't send me to camp or anything. I just got to ride around in my dad's truck um, and go to these job sites, right? So my parents are from San Diego. We were working a lot in Rancho Santa Fe, Encinitas, La Costa, all these kinds of high-end area. So I, I grew up with that. So when I got into flipping, I was making sure the scribes were tight to the wall. I was making sure I was putting crown molding in all of the rooms. And all of a sudden I get out of my first flip and I'm, I lost $4,600, right? So I go into my next flip and I'm not going to make the same mistake again. I over renovate again. I make $15,000 and I kept seeing this pattern, right? And I went, you know what? I'm going to jump into the higher end space because I feel like I can't over renovate that, right? And that was just an hypothesis at the time. Now, talking seven years later, it couldn't be more true because what I found, and I know it's on one of the bullet points that I put in the email, you get that money back in luxury. And that's what I like about it. Um, I'm a contrarian to start. So when everybody, and, and I hear you guys saying at the mastermind, and I completely understand why it's like, Hey, this is our bread and butter. This is what we go for. It's high volume. I'm the opposite. I want low volume, high margin. I don't want to show up to a, a new Western disposition sale. And there's 40 other guys there you know, bidding the property up. And my margin went from 40 to 30 to 25. And then I go, well, if I just do the plumbing myself, I can get the margin back. And if I just run the electrical myself, I can get that margin back. And I've seen a lot of my friends do that, that get into it as they start to talk themselves into deals. Whereas when you get more experience, but especially in the luxury side, I talk myself out of a lot of deals because I go, I'm not touching this one. And so I've, I've, I've gotten a lot more done um, with other people versus doing it myself. And I don't fall into that trap anymore. So when I'm looking at a house and I'm doing back of the envelope calculations, you know, I'm starting at 200, $250,000 spreads just roughly, right? Knowing if something bad happens and I have to rewire a house, because I see that a lot in what I do is I get these houses from 1964 or something like that using aluminum wire, no ground wire, stuff like that. When those surprises come and knock you out of a 30,000 profit margin house, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket for me on mine. It means my spread goes from 180 to 160. And then the next major thing that happens, oh, you know, we went up and it's not just that we have to replace the roof, but all the decking has rotted out and we have to replace all the decking. So, you know, my cost in South Texas to redo a roof is about eight to $9,000 um, for probably like a 20, 25 square roof, something like that. But if I have to replace the decking, it doubles, right? So if I come in in one of my houses, and I have to absorb that. And I, my cost goes from nine to 18. All right. My profit margin just went from 180 to 160 to 150. Um, and so you can absorb a lot more of those unforeseen things um, in the luxury space. So that's kind of a two prong answer to what you're saying is I like my niche because I have less competition on the upside or on the, in the beginning, I don't bid myself into an issue, you know, by overpaying for properties. I just don't. And actually I get them at a much steeper discount because again, I'm alone in my space in South Texas. Now, everybody's got a different market, right? But in, in my market, if you're looking at the $250,000, $340,000 home range, which is what we are average and median home prices, I'm buying at half a million and I'm selling upwards of $900,000 to $1.2 million. I'm the only one showing up. <laughs> I'm the only one that that seller is talking to. So I'm their option or the bank is going gonna to buy their house. So once I started to see that, you know, it's like you've got a lot more a lot more leverage when you're negotiating. Um, and so you can really get those steep discounts. And then on the on the other side, when I go to flip those houses, one, if my designer comes in and decides he wants to do marble everywhere, I get that back at appraisal. And I get that back because I get waivers of appraisal because when the wife walks in and she goes, this is the most beautiful house I've seen in this price point, they're willing to do the waivers. So I think that clientele just hedges a lot of those issues that we see in the median home price. And there's no there's nothing wrong with that that route. One of my best friends does that. He does high volume, 30 to $40,000 spreads. Um, and he, he does better than I do, you know, technically, uh, profit wise. But for me, I only have to do three to four a year. You know, my hope now is to jump that to six to eight and hopefully 10 a year and, and 
double my profit, but I can make about the same doing three houses as somebody else has to do 12 houses. And so for me, that's, that's a lot safer place to be um, versus having 12 houses that can go wrong. I've got three and I can usually absorb that with the, with the high margins. There's a, there's something that I wrote down as you were talking. Um, I wrote down, do what you know. So like you got a background growing up in more luxury homes. I know Rancho Santa Fe very well. It's uh, yeah. they're amazing houses there. Like, and 1.2 million is like, that's like a garage in Rancho Santa Fe. Yeah. <laughs> so you saying luxury in Austin for the people that are listening in like San Francisco, LA, San Diego, uh, even like, you know, DC or some of these uh, Miami, that, that's not even luxury for them. Right. So like, like Nathan yeah. said, kind of look at your, look at your area. Um, the one thing that I knew, I tried to wholesale those deals. So the houses that I bought, I tried to wholesale them first. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, there were like two or three people on my list of thousands that were even like I knew would would be able to buy a house like that when I'm wholesaling yeah. it for five or 600,000. And so I remember one guy, there was like one guy that I thought I could sell these to and he didn't, he, he didn't want it. So then I was like, all right, well, we should just try it. And I'll say for the people that are listening, I'm not saying that I shouldn't have done a luxury home, nor do I think that you can't make money. I absolutely do. What I tried to do is I tried to take my systems and processes and my team from one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars houses, and inject them in seven hundred thousand dollars houses. That was my problem. That's what. That's looking back yeah. when I look at what I did wrong, is that's what I did wrong. So, mine was like a contractor that's used to putting in. We have like A, B, C type homes where we have like paint and carpet. Then we had our B, which is like a little bit nicer. Then we had our C, which was like, oh, we're gonna put in um, like granite instead of laminate countertops. Yeah. You know, and just yeah. we didn't know that all of these things were happening. A couple of lessons I learned were price drops are a lot bigger in high-end homes. There's yeah. less buyers there. So they are looking for that thing where they walk in and they get wowed to the point where there might only be in our area, 10 or 20 houses like that, that are on the market. And they're looking at every single one of them and picking their favorite, as opposed to we're getting, you know, 50 people coming in on day one. So what does it look like for you to, you, you mentioned your ARVs and things like that. Um, what does yeah. it look like for you, for your team? And how is it different if somebody wants to build that versus, so I'm thinking like contractors, what does a contractor look like? The designers, those kind of yeah. things. Well, how does a team look different than your buddy who's doing, you know, 12 or 15 of these houses that are making 30 grand on median home price? Easy. You're looking at the team. So it's me. Um, and so I can handle it all myself. I did just hire a project manager. Um, at Dave Morse's suggestion. So thanks. So this is why that. you joined the group. Like you, <laughs> yeah, right now yeah. you're, you're doing yeah. everything. So what does it look like for you? Like you're designing it, you're, you're the general so contractor, you're doing it all. I, yeah. So I'm the GC, I'm the GC. And I do want to touch on something that you said, cause I think it's really important before I go too deep into that. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I am the GC on all the projects. Um, but again, when you're doing lower volume, you can, you can be the GC for what I'm doing. I want to be that eye for detail because of what you're saying with the buyer pool. Right. So I want the most control. It's the same reason why I list all my homes. Now I use a buddy to kind of do it. Um, so it's under his name, but I field all the phone calls. And I think that's huge in this space as well, is if you're going to do it, you handle all the negotiations. Nobody wants to sell your home like you do, especially when you're paying $4,000, $5,000 a month in interest only payments to your lender, right? So I, I highly suggest that if you get into this space, yes, there's, there's great agents out there, but Right off the top, I saved $36,000 on my last house because I listed it myself. I'm a huge proponent that these luxury homes sell themselves. If you do it, if you do the buying right, like anything else in our, our business, right? If you buy right in the right areas, and that's what I look for. I look for streets that are in high demand, that there's been no inventory. And if I can find something in that area, something pops up, they're going, man, I've been wanting to live in, in River Crossing for the last eight years. Finally, something popped up, right? So that, that's huge. But yeah, I, I hire a designer. That's key. Um, I was actually surprised at the Myrtle Beach event how many other guys said that, oh yeah, I started doing that too. It's the best money you'll ever spend. Now don't go overspend paying $5,000, $8,000 for a firm. Find some individual who will do it for you. I pay him $1,500 a house all in. And so he so gives me the he board. Just, he just consults. He like, will look at pictures or walk yep. through the property and then just pick out the layouts of all of it. So flat fee, $1,500. 100%. What square footage is, of the house is that? I, I mean, up for what I do up to like 3,800 square foot. Um, okay. And so it's kind of, if I get him more involved and this is, we could talk for hours about this, but like I treat him well, right? So it's 1,500 on the front end. If that house sells for over ask, sells in two, three days because he knocked it out of the park with his design, I'm throwing him another $1,500 or two grand on the back end as a bonus, right? So yeah. it's just, and he knows that I'm giving him 1,500 up front. 
he knows on the back end, I'm going to pay him as well, but it's just for the actual time that he's putting into it. He's putting three or four hours into it, but he's phenomenal. So that and staging, those are the two things that I always do on every house. If you're getting into luxury, you have to have a designer. You have to stage them. If you don't, you're going to be running into problems. Let's um, talk about the staging real but, quick while we're on it. Full yeah. stage, you stage every room or what does it look like? Yeah. Big, the bigger the house, the more rooms, yes, because it starts to look more and more empty. So I always do family, living, dining, kitchen, all bathrooms, no matter what. And then depending on how many bedrooms, it's always the master with master bath. Um, if it's like this last one, I did a, a four bed. I did one upstairs just so they could visualize one of the ones upstairs. You know, um, it's just they start to look empty. So if it's like a three, two, I stage everything. Uh, if it's a, a four, two, four, three, something like that, I'll, I'll typically stage everything, anything above that. I'll start to pick the the other bedrooms. I've always staged all mine, even like lower cost houses, $200,000 house. I staged yeah. all of them, the bedrooms too. What I found was if you don't stage a house, people like they, their eyes go different places. I want to draw their eyes to, to the staging, the look of the house. And they stop looking for the imperfections of a flipped house. They know it was renovated, it was flipped. If it's empty, then they start like looking for things. And the next thing you know, they just start digging and digging. Like we're not building a brand new house. Even my brand new house, yeah. the punch list was longer than any flip I've ever you know, done in my life. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, they're always looking for something, especially with flips and the kind of the mentality that people have with all the TV shows. Now um, you mentioned something. I know you want to go back to something I said, you want to do that now? What yeah. was it? Yeah. Just real quick. You were, you were mentioning the wholesaling, right? And I think you hit the nail on the head, but why I want to flip it and show people why that's an advantage is exactly what you said as a wholesaler's perspective is there's no end buyer, right? If you're that end buyer, be loud about it. Because the way that I looked at it yeah. is, if I've got 12 or 15 wholesalers and they happen to come across my deal, that deal flow for me, like I'm saying, is three to four houses a year. I'm trying to double that to six to eight, right? If the 15 or 20 wholesalers in my in my network come across a deal, they don't have to search for it. They don't have to be doing advertising for it, but they come across it. That's money that they weren't going to get. They're going to call me immediately and go, I've got one for you. And so my deal flow, since I've just said that to every single person I talk to, my niche is luxury. If you find luxury, I talk to agents about it. I talk to other investors about it. I talk to every wholesaler about it. That naturally brings me my deal flow. And I've got more deals than I can handle in my, in my area, you know? So that's my next step is getting the private funding and, and expanding. But just from word of mouth, I have that because wholesalers don't have anybody to sell them to. So they might not market for you, but I do. I have a couple with network with net worth, sorry, that he knows. And so every now and then he's hitting an area, he'll go outside of it a little bit and hit those two or three side streets for me. And we get deals that way. So you will be one of the only ones in there in that space. And those wholesalers know that they're going to bring it to you. And I understand from your perspective, if you're marketing and spending money, you probably don't want to because if you've got one buyer, you're not going to target it, right? So it's it's a different approach of spread your net out there. But when you, they know you're the only one in your market doing it, they're going to bring you every single one. And so for me, my, my deal flow is more than I can even handle um, just because of that. Yeah. So I started as a flipper and then I became a wholesaler because I was doing a lot of direct marketing for me as a flipper. And what I was realizing is I was like, I was like a, a fisherman that was throwing a net in the ocean and all, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking for one specific species. Right. And I'm throwing all this trash fish back, like all these like good, yeah. like good deals, but I don't have, I didn't have a buyer's list. I didn't have anything. And I actually thought wholesaling was like really sleazy and stuff like that in the beginning until I met Andy McFarlane and, and Justin Williams really Andy, he was the wholesaler and, and he's doing it ethically, uh, had integrity. I love the guy. I mean, the business that he built was incredible until then I was seeing all these people in my market that I just didn't, I didn't feel like had the utmost integrity. I didn't feel like they were really yep. doing the best by Same selling experience. people around yep. them. Same. And so, um, so I, what I realized was, well, okay, I'm only looking for a specific house in a specific area. And I have, I'm not even but I'm not doing anything with these other leads. It was horrible. And I was just wasting a ton of money. So that's when I kind of shifted to wholesaling and then still flipped on the side. But if I was a luxury flipper, I mean, the, the other thing is the ability to actually target these houses is easy. If I'm doing direct marketing for me as a knowing what I know, I mean, I could target for you only the type of houses that you want to buy in areas that you want to buy. And you can hit them really hard. And like, you could be the only person who's really, because most people are actually like weeding out the high end houses. Like when I, my, my price point, when I'm yeah. running my list, I keep it below a certain uh, area and threshold yeah. because I don't have a lot of buyers. Um, I would come across houses on Pensacola beach for a pay-per-click and stuff like that. I just, I didn't have any buyers, so we would have to pass on them. And so it's interesting. I'm, I'm interested. One thing you said was before I move on, 
you list yeah. your own houses. I'm curious about that because I would feel like if I listed, so I used to do this. I, I had an agent. Um, I built an agent team in my company where I was the I was the lead agent, and then I had I hired another woman to do all my listings. So I get fifty percent fifty percent reduction on our our list. She get like one percent, and she loved it because she had signs all over. She would get the buyers that came in that didn't, weren't represented, and people calling her signs and stuff like that. And we you know we had twenty thirty signs around Pensacola. Um, yeah. But I felt like I always took things a little bit personal. Like it was my house. It was kind of my baby. I was working on it. So like if they were calling me and I was talking to them directly or I had to deal with the um, the appraiser or the uh, inspector, I just got really aggravated. And it might just be my personality, but that was my house. And so I always yeah. wanted somebody in between me and the buyer or me and the buyer's agent because I just got kind of ticked off all the time when they're saying stuff like that. How do you handle that? And yeah. what do you recommend for people that are listing their own houses? You are 100% right. So that that was reps, right? So in the beginning, that happened to me too. I actually sold the house for $875,000 after putting 160000 into it. Two days later, they started a full renovation of the property. I was furious because I had just done everything to the nines, you know? And so I took offense to it. My dad kind of walked me through that going, hey man, it's sold. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So what I do now is I'm there for all of it, right? And so I take a different mental approach. So I am there when the appraiser is there, or I'm putting together an appraisal packet myself, I'm controlling what I can control. And then it's easier to let go of what you can't, right? If I can't make the appraisal packet, I don't show up and I don't need appraisal. I could get mad at the appraiser, I guess, but it's me because I didn't do what I needed to do to hedge that from happening. Right? So I show up for that. I show up for the inspections. I talk to all the inspectors, right? It's, it's still a human, it's a person to person industry, no matter what, right? So they're there to do a thing. They're there on their checklist. They're doing things for liability reasons and whatnot, right? But the conversation they have with that agent or the buyer is different once they've talked to me. When they find something and I say, okay, but let me show you what else I did on this roof. I replaced X, Y, Z. If there's a small thing there, it's kind of, it's a small issue that you know I can fix really, really quickly. Just by having that conversation, he's going to turn around and say that to, to that agent. Hey, you know what? He was there. He showed me all the work that he did. It is a very small thing versus going, Hey, I found this thing. The guy said he redid the roof, but there's a crack right there. This guy doesn't have craftsmanship whatsoever. It's still a person. It's a human to human business. Just by being there kind of dulls their sword a bit. Um, and so I am there for absolutely everything. Just like I think agents should be. I've just found that most agents aren't. Um, and then kind of touching on what you said before about bringing in agents and, and you know commissions and all of that. I feel like my money is much better spent if I am absorbing a 6% commission, right? I would rather do three and I keep three and now I can offer a one or one and a half percent buyer's agent commission. I'm still saving $18,000, but that other agent's getting an extra $18,000, right? So that to me is where I'm going to put that money versus a listing agent. I don't think a listing agent is worth the 3% commission that they get. I hope people don't get really bad and start sending me nasty emails for saying that, but I just, I found that to be true. The homes that I do, I did all of the work. The homes tend to sell themselves if I've done what I'm supposed to do. So I would rather give that buyer's agent 4% and then watch how many offers come in at ask when you're giving them 4% on a $900,000 house or a $1.2 million house. That's not chump change. When you're offering 4% on a $250,000 house, it's something, you know, it's a little bit of extra spending change. I just paid for somebody's vacation to Hawaii by giving them that extra 1%. And I think that's very powerful in what I do and a better use of that commission structure. Cool. Sorry if I like that, that kind of went off on a tangent. No, no, I agree with that. I'd say um, to, to understand, like what I try to do is to, I took a step back from like how I was doing it. So now I have like a cool off period before I get an appraisal or an inspection. So there's systems and process that we get taken around that. Like if I had to list the houses or things like that. Um, what I always found was, if I wasn't dealing, like once I got finished a project in the beginning, so the first house I ever did, um, I did everything. Like I was, I was doing the work. I was kind of working with the GC. I, I did some of the work on on the home, um, but I found it. You know, we I bought it. I was going to closing to sign the paperwork. I was working with the agent. I was just doing all of it, you know. And afterwards, I got done, and I was like, oh crap, I don't have another house. And then it took six months for me to find the next one. And so it took me, so six months to find the next one, then six months to renovate that one. And then I did the same thing the second time. And I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. So what I tried to do is once I get done with the project, if I could hand it off, then I go work on the next one. I wonder as you scale what the plan is for you to be as involved as you are. Because I mean, as the coach, I'm like, yeah. look, 
You're talking about 3% on a $1.2 million house, which is, yeah, it's savings for you. But what if you could go out and make another $234,000 on the next house while an agent is dealing with that stuff over the next 45 days? So now forget the 3%, you're going to go out and make 200 grand or your average of $140,000. And you go find the next house and start working on it as opposed to, so you can start scaling. What's your plan to kind of scale up? Yeah. Do you realize that you have to get out of the day-to-day -day, uh, stuff that you're doing? I do. I do. What I will say though, is like how I said in the beginning that nobody wants to sell your house like you do. That's um, true. I get what you're saying about, is it worth taking that reduced commission? The reason why I'm so, so adamant about it is the first thing an agent does when a house is on the market for a month is what do they do a price drop. So on the surface, it might seem like, Oh, it's only 18,000. But for me, I'm sticking to that price point. I'm having those phone calls. I can't tell you how many times I followed up with agents and they go, I followed up with the agent. Here's the text message. And I go, a text message. Yeah. No, pick up the phone and call them. Right. So it seems like it's a $36,000 difference. And yeah, Nate, go do the next one. That can turn into 50 or 60 really quickly because a listing agent's best friend is a price drop. And like you said earlier on a $900,000 house, that can mean $50,000. Yeah. So no, I will always be involved in that. And you're going to hate this next answer even more than that is I give, the, I give the buyers my cell phone number and I tell them for a year, you can call me. I don't put it in writing. Um, and I, I know everybody I tell this who goes, what? Like I told you in the beginning, I'm a contrarian. I'm a relationships person. The second I do that, and when I meet sellers, I've, I've met 90% of my buyers, sorry, um, before the transaction is finished. Every time they go, I don't know what it is, but I just trust you. And I'm like, because I stand behind my product. Here's yep. my cell phone number. Nice to meet you. This last house I just sold, I gave it to the father-in-law, the mother-in-law and the grandmother. If anything happens, here's my personal cell phone number. The amount of ease that gives them when I do that, and I stand behind that, you know, because I'm also looking at it going, yeah, I'm making $180,000 spreads. I can afford for the next year, even if I eat another 10 grand. But my reputation, I can only have once, right? Yeah. So to me, those are costs that I'm, I'm willing to eat. So then, sorry to answer your, your other question about scaling. Hey, that before you move on, before you move on, yeah. let, let me jump in here. Because it, when we go back to that house that I got sued on, um, if those buyers, the people that that had the house, if they had just called me and or just emailed me or just reached out to me or or my company at all, we would have been able to fix exactly what the problem they had. They had wood rot around the house. And so there was a picture, there was a picture that my agent took. Her and her team were on a boat because it's on the water, taking pictures of our listing. So what I did, I, I got hit with so much WDO around that time. That before I bought the house, I did a wood destroying organism inspection. So look for yep. wood rot. I did one before I bought the house and we fixed everything during. I did one before I listed it and I fixed everything that that inspector found. And so before we listed it, like we were doing that uh, inspection, he found some stuff. We were fixing it. So we were around a window fixing some of that wood siding on it next to the next to the water. And so next to the, the salt water. And so my agent was there taking pictures from her boat and took one where there was scaffolding around one of the windows. And it was obvious that we were doing some work there. Well, they took that picture and it was on Zillow. Like that picture was still on Zillow yeah. like two years later. <laughs> two years later, they found some wood rot. They pulled off all the siding, found all this wood rot all around the whole house. That There's no possible way we could have known about. It. They used that picture and said he knew about it. He was covering it up with all the scaffolding. It was a, it was a different window. Like when they pulled, yeah. showed me the pictures from that window, yeah. it was all stuff that we'd done. And so... If they had just called me, I could have, and they fixed it all and they were suing me for like 50 grand or something. I could have yeah. done that for like $5,000, like all the work that they did, my crew. Yeah. And they got some attorney who was like, oh yeah, that horrible house flipper. So if they had just called me and, and the setup that you have, if they had my number or they would just reached out to the, mm -hmm. to the company, we would have taken care of it. Like exactly like you're saying, my yeah, reputation is, is better. Like I need that. And so yeah. that's why I bought the house back instead of settling. I was not like, I was not going to admit that I did something wrong and, and write them a check for 50 grand, even if it's not me admitting. So many people at that time were like, dude, just write the check. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, what are you doing? Don't just write this. I was like, I can't, I cannot physically write this check. I just can't do it. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know about it. I didn't do the wrong thing. I'm getting shaken down. And so if they just had, so I, I don't, I don't hate you for what you just said. And I, I think, <laughs> I think it's admirable. I really do. I, I do. 
I think more people out there should stand by their product. They should uh, be willing to do that. Now, I, I think that we're different animals. Like, I don't want yeah. people to have my cell phone number. I don't want to. Um, yeah. I don't want to be doing all the work. I really love the fact. And sometimes I make less money for being able to scale myself out of the business because I do want to be able to leave, take vacations, and build a business that runs without me. However, um, I'll be the first one to say I do stand by my product. Uh, I've I've written people money back from coaching, from training, from events, things like that. Like, I don't want that bad juju around me at all. Yeah. And so, uh, so I don't, I'm not upset with you. Yeah. I think it's, I, uh, I think there's some, yeah, I just think there's something to be said that if you open that door for them in the beginning, I know people say, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. I just haven't found that in the luxury space. You will get people like that, that are rich. They know it. They're going to sue you. I get it. Um, but sometimes if you open that, so they know it's an option, they might be lawyers, doctors, whatever. And all they know is to litigate, right? But again, we're people. So if I just go, here's my cell phone, if anything happens, because I want first dibs, I'm taking out massive structural walls sometimes and 35 foot steel I-beams that I had to have welding teams come and do. I want first dibs at fixing that versus a lawsuit. So that's why I do it. I know, yeah, it might be a headache. And don't get me wrong. If they do call me, hey, there's an issue with the house or we want to have this whole thing painted because we couldn't get the city to approve this, but paint, paint our whole fence. I'm not going out and doing it. I'm hiring my guys, you know? So for the five minutes it takes me on the phone, I think it's well worth the potential headache or, or lawsuit down the road. So, yeah, you, so you're going to talk about scaling a little bit and then I got a couple yeah. more questions for you. Yeah. So the, the first step I think was, was definitely hiring my project manager. Um, he's been great. So he's an ex flipper um, and home builder. Who's just, you know, he's got some health issues going on right now. And so he's like, I just don't want the stress of having to run my own business anymore. So we're the perfect fit. Um, we did the culture index. He's the opposite of me. He's too, super complimentary of me. So right when I sent that to Dave, he's like, that's the one hire him. So thanks again to Dave for doing that. Um, cause it, it's, it's been paying dividends for me, but having that to do the construction day to day is how I scale. So I like conversations with banks. I like solving the high level problems. I no longer really am interested in figuring out what walls I'm going to take out and how I'm going to do it. It's still fun. It's engaging. Um, but as for paint, I, I just don't care to be a part of that. I'll do special touches. I'll do custom mantles or wrapping columns or faux wood beams. I'll do that myself because I take pride in doing that work. But for the most part, I've, I've divvied that all off, um, to, to my latest hire. So that plus with, um, the financing that we now get through Kiabi, that's the other one, right? So that was the other thing that was kind of stopping me from scaling was the higher end homes when you're doing a, you know, an 85% uh, LTC on that, I'm bringing 160 grand to the table, then I've got to do renovations, right? So now with 100% financing, it frees up a lot of that money. Um, and so I was talking to Lyle Spann about it actually too. So this is another um, awesome connection that I've got. But Lyle convinced me of that as well. He's like, dude, take the 100%. It's going to free up your time. It might cost you a little bit more money, um, but it's going to free you up to do other things and free up your, your checkbook to take on multiple properties so that I don't run into that issue of, all right, I finished the property and I got to wait six months for the next one. Now, when they come in my pipeline, it's like, well, I can afford it because I don't have 160 sunk in this. Um, and so I can do multiple projects at once and kind of line them up. And so that's that's really helped me to start scaling already. So having that one employee that kind of takes the day-to-day -day off of my plate, um, like the insurance company called me this morning that I have to go locate all the fire hydrants in the area because they can't find them. So we can't insure the property unless we know where the fire hydrants are. That was me, you know, four months ago. And I would go around and snap all the photos. Well, now he's doing that for me. So I can focus on the other stuff of the other call of, hey, we have to extend this contract because um, the sellers are an elderly couple and, and now they're getting cold feet because they don't want to move so quickly because it's sentimental. I can have those conversations now because I'm not 10 foot up on a ladder, right? And that's where my skill set is better used now. Um, and so I am willing to take less in profit in order to do higher volume, but I don't want that to be confused with, I'm not trying to do hundred houses a year, <laughs> you know, like I'll, I'll cap it 10 or 12, um, something like that because- I'm making decent money um, and that's the lifestyle that I want to live. And so I'm happy to be there. So my scaling is scaled up to my highest point of efficiency and effectiveness. That's the way that I say it. Once I'm there and I'm fully efficient with my use of time and resources, that's where I want to be because the money flows um, when you're you know, doing 150, 160 a flip times eight flips or 10 flips a year. That's a decent living. I don't need to be a billionaire. <laughs> I've got, you know, I'll have a plenty, plenty decent lifestyle once I hit that point. Yeah, I love that. I think, and the cool part about what we do inside of our group that that I love is it's not like one shoe fits all. 
like lawn size, like you have to fit in this box. Um, every You can design your business, your life, however you want. So I just uh, did a show with a guy named Dave Miller who was talking about he doesn't want to be responsible at all. He loves building his team. He wants to be completely removed so that they can travel. They spend a couple months in Breckenridge every year. He just wants to be like hands off. Like yeah. he he believes that you should build every every business virtually, whether you're in your market or not, that you never have to go to the home. Where you're like, this is this is like just a full on opposite conversation that I'm having. And the cool part is, we both live in the same place, we are in the same group, yeah. and we just have different mentalities of what we're building. And and it's okay to build. If you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out like how to pivot your business or how to start your business or how to build something, my recommendation is just start wherever you want to go right now. Like you don't have to figure out what it's going to look like ten years from now because I'll tell you, your skill set will change, your mindset will change, your bank account will change, your life will change, every Everything will change. And along the way, you can make little zigs and zags wherever you want. Like I was going to buy 10 rental houses, try to make $10,000 a month, 120 grand a year on my rental houses. And then uh, three years into that, I sold them all. And I took that money and I bought seven figure flipping with it. I had no idea I was going to have an opportunity to buy this company, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. But then it came up and I, I said, hey, my return on equity would be really better, uh, a lot better if I put it somewhere else and built, bought a business that could produce something for me that I already love to do. And I'm doing it for free basically. And so yeah. things are going to change. And now I put, I have tax problems. So I put a lot of money in apartment syndications and, um, and, and like we just bought a storage unit deal that I put sunk money into because I need the tax write-offs. I bought an airplane for a tax write-off, a car, all kinds of stuff that I love to do. Now my life looks totally different. And now I make different decisions with what I do. The businesses yeah. that I build look different and that's okay. So Nathan, you might be like, I'm going to be at every house. I'm giving away my cell phone number. And you might listen to this two years from now and be like, what the heck was I talking about? That was crazy. <laughs> you know, and, and just let yourself be okay with that. I think everybody tries oh, yeah. to plan so much of the future that they never get started today. So what yeah. recommendation would you give to somebody who's listening to this and like, you know what? I want to jump into this house flipping, but the luxury home really scares the crap out of me because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. the money, things like that. Like, is it a good place for somebody to start from the beginning what do you think i i think it is um again it, it's kind of like when you're when you're starting to get into business or being an entrepreneur and people say what's the difference for you you'll get this it's like what's the difference between buying a house versus an apartment complex it's an extra zero right and you get told that a lot when you're starting out um so for me in my whole model it's like i have so many hedges against the market against interest rates my, my buyers don't really care what interest rates are doing. Right. They're coming in, they're paying cash for a third of the homes for a million dollars, right? So those market fluctuations don't bother my clientele. So I strongly believe you can get burned a lot worse when you're starting in an entry level versus what I'm doing, right? And if it's somebody else that's in seven figure, like by all means, call me and I'll walk you through everything. Like this is the coolest group I've ever been a part of, you know? So it's like, if you want to do it and you're in seven figure, call me, I will walk you through every deal. Um, the second answer to that, and again, I, this one's going to kind of come out of left field is if you want to do it, quit your job. I know there's people and this might be controversial, right? And I know everybody has a different route. Like we've talked about, I'll tell you, I quit my job. I went back to my job. I got laid off from my job. Once I got laid off from my job, my real estate completely took off exponentially because I had nowhere else to put my 40, 60 hours a week. I was running hotels, right? So I'm working 60 hours a week doing real estate on the side. And it's a trickle, trickle, trickle. And everybody thinks they're going to build this business that way. It's not a business. It's your secondary thing you're focused on. I'm a huge proponent. If you want to get into flipping, you can do it in any realm. If you want to do it in first-time home buyer, you want to do it in median home price or luxury, quit your job and watch what will happen. When you don't have plan B, watch how plan A works out. And I just see so many people, and, and I know you've, you've probably seen this as well. It's friends and family. Everybody who sees what we do goes, oh, I want to do that. If only I could do that. It's just, I have a kid. Oh, I have this. I'm married. You're not. It, 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 the, the excuses just line up. Um, so take that excuse away. Quit your job. When you have nothing else to do and that is your job, you'll treat it like your job. You will be efficient with your money. You will answer phone calls. You will go to meetings. You aren't going to push off showings. You're going to go to every single showing. You're going to do those things like a real business and your business will take off. So I know not everybody's going to agree with that, um, but I wholeheartedly believe, believe that if you want to have the financial freedom, and you find it in real estate, there's more millionaires from real estate than any other, you know, realm. It's because they take, they treat it as a full-time job and they put all their effort. And so if you're taking your four hours a week, but really you could be putting 60 hours a week into real estate, how could you fail? If you're putting 60 hours a week of your time from your W2 job into real estate, treating it as such, it's going to blow up. It just is. 
Yeah, I, I actually really like that because the, the thing that I tell people a lot of times that are scared to quit their job is like, you can get another job and you probably get, you hate yeah. your job right now and you yeah, have you this skill set. Like you could either go back there or you could probably get a better job that's paying more money right now than what you're making right now yeah. <laughs> starting over. So just like take a leap and unless you have like zero skills, you have zero resume, you're not valuable to the marketplace, like, and and you somebody hired you out of like sheer just, uh, they just want you to do well. Like you're working for a family business or something. There's no possible way you have any background yeah. and can get a, a job that's paying what you're paying right now. Like most of us, we can just, I can get a job anytime I want. Like right now I'm like, holy crap. If I was out in the marketplace, I'd be making a lot of money. I can just choose what I, mm -hmm. I'm never going to work for somebody else again. But the mindset that people have is like, oh, I, I will win dot, dot, dot. And it's like, mm -hmm. that'll, that's never going to never come. happen. Um, no. Yeah. Hey, uh, we, we got, we're like, I could, I could talk to you for like another hour. This is awesome. I have like 50 yeah. more questions I want to ask, but um, really where I want to go. So you mentioned Kiabi. I want to mention that real quick. So Kiabi used to be lending home. We have a deal with them for our altitude and runway members. If you've done five uh, transactions in the last two years, so five flips, uh, you have to exit five properties the last two years, then they will fund a hundred percent of your purchase um, and rehab. So um you have to apply for it, obviously. So you're getting, you're going to work on getting funding from them. Um, I really wanted to go to the funding route, but I just want to mention that. So if anybody's on the fence, like in Nathan's situation, it's almost like a no brainer to join Altitude yep. to get just the funding from Kiabi. I have a lot of people from like San Francisco, LA, San Diego, that sometimes they just come there just for that. And they're like, holy crap, this community has got a lot for me. And um, so that's a big push that I'll give. It's, it's just one thing you mentioned. I just wanted to touch on. Yep. Um, we have an event coming up, Flip Hacking Live. And, um, it's October 12th, 13th, and 14th. Have you, you've never been to this event before, right? I have not. I'm signed up, but I have not been yet. Yeah. Cool. So you're coming to the event in October. Yep. Awesome. A uh, really great event. We spent three days talking about stuff just like this. Like we actually lay out everybody that comes on stage in a presentation is laying out exactly what they're doing um, and, and exactly how. So like in a presentation like this, this would be exactly how you can flip luxury houses mm -hmm. and why Nathan thinks that it's like, 10 times better to do that than entry-level homes. Um, Vaughn Bethel did a presentation on driving for dollars. He gave his exact systems. The software he uses, yeah. how he pays his people, like the blueprint for that. Um, I've done tons of presentations in the past. We got marketing presentations, his exact sales strategies and structures. So if you want to get started in this business, I want you to go to fliphackinglive.com and check it out. And the other thing that I'm doing right now is as I bring these, these guests on the show, I want you guys to vote to tell me if they should be speaking at Flip Hacking Live. Uh, this year. So if you guys hear something on, on the show that you're like, I want more of that. What I want you to do is I want you to reply to our email. I want you to tag me on Facebook. I want you to reach out and just like, you can put a screenshot of this and tag me and be like, I want to hear Nathan on stage talking about luxury homes in more detail for his presentation. So um, that's what I want you guys to do that are listening. And I have some really cool guests and we're doing more shows and more podcasts about the speakers at Flip Hacking Live coming up. But I do still have like three or four slots that are not finalized yet that are gonna be like podcast guests that you guys vote on a little bit like, I don't know, like American Idol or something. So um, I'm really excited about that. I think this would be a really cool topic. I think it's something that I bet if you had time to prepare a 20 or 30 minute presentation, then you could lay out like exactly how oh, they can do it too. Right. Yeah. So and, vote for me. Vote for me because I. Love to and do it. It, so <laughs> I if you guys want to make make two hundred and thirty four thousand dollars on one house, forget <laughs> the resale price of it. That's the profit. Yeah. Um, honestly, in an area where you're selling houses for one point two million, we didn't get into the financing. We didn't get into how you're finding yeah. these houses, how you're negotiating them, how you're getting that kind of margins. There's all kinds of stuff that we could go, and maybe we'll bring you on again on another show. What yeah. is there anything left that I didn't ask you that you wanted to mention? Um, I got about two minutes before my next. Uh, a call and I don't know this guy in two minutes, so yeah. I have to be on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, I, yeah, on my notes, I think the one thing that I just want to reiterate is that everybody does focus on that first time home buyer. Um, and I know I've already mentioned that, right? So who gets left out in that is the high paid professional. And I think that's a massively untapped market. The reason being cities always grow outward, but they typically work in the middle, right? And so as there's no more land, there's no more houses for them to live in, and they want to live in a city center, what's left? It's dated homes that they've got to purchase for $640,000 and rehab themselves. What doctor or lawyer has time to do that? They don't. They want a turnkey solution, right? So 
that's where I think that this this niche, why I think it's so powerful is as it moves outward, 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 there's so many opportunities here. Um, and a lot of the agents that bring me deals, they'll come in and say, well, we're going to list it on the market for 700,000. And I just go, okay, well, I'll be waiting here when I'll pick it up for 550 because I know that mentality of a wealthy person wants something turnkey. So um, it's just another another avenue that I like to let people know about. You know, it's like they're the, they're kind of the forgotten market um, and they get kind of pushed into the, or lumped into this group of, well, they're going to build a custom home. And it's like, yeah, they might be nitpicky, but that's time, money, effort. They're paying construction loan costs. That's that's massively eating into their their cash flow. They can't go on vacations. It's a headache, right? So what do we do throughout every tier of, of, of flipping is we try to be the high-level problem solver, be the high-level problem solver for high-paying individuals who can pay cash. Interest rates don't bother them. I love my niche. I can talk about it all day long, but um, I just think people think the buyer pool is so small, but so is the inventory. And so when you've got five people looking for the one house and you're the one house, I, I, I have not not had multiple offers on the last six houses I've done. Every house I've done in the last six of them, I've had multiple offers over ask. It, I love it. I don't know. The, the, other so, thing, so. the other thing to mention is the luxury people that have a ton of money don't really get hit by changes in the marketplace. The big recessions yep. and things like that, these people are, are somewhat recession proof, you typically in, in that, that area. All right. Uh, how can people get a hold of you quickly? Like if there's uh, a way that they want to reach out, is there a website or someplace that they can go, social media or what? Yeah, Facebook, uh, Nathan D. Wint. That's the easiest way. Um, Instagram, it's Nate Cape to Cape, I believe. Uh, I used to travel all over the world and stuff. So that was Cape to Cape. That was where that came from. Um, my email is Shona Investments LLC at gmail.com. Um, and then my phone number, I, I think a couple of guys did it as well. I'm fine with it. 760 803 5921. You can call me, text me, however you want to get a hold of me. I know most people won't. So I'm not scared. <laughs> and if you got a high-end deal in Austin, Texas, you better send it to Nathan. All right, cool. Uh, hey, don't forget, go to fliphackinglive.com and grab your tickets. It's just coming up in just under two months. Um, if uh, if you guys want to learn more about our uh, altitude program, seven the number sevenfigurealtitude.com, we'll put in the show notes. And I encourage you guys to reach out to us and have a conversation to see if we would be the right fit for you. Nathan, thanks for hanging out with me today. I got to go. I'll see Appreciate you guys on the next show. Thank Bye. you.